last week we started talking about this topic called goal and pathway. Remember that? To succeed in anything, we said, especially in spiritual matter, we need clarity, great clarity in both our goals and our the pathway to that goal is the path to that goal. And goal is, what, what is it going to look like when you achieve what you wanted to achieve? It's not some general goal that you talk about, you know, I want to be more spiritual. That means, they, it doesn't mean anything, you know. You have to have a specific goal. It's like when I, by the end of 2018, I want to have, you know, known about how to hear the voice of God. Or at the end of 2018, I want to recognize how the voice of God sounds like. And if you have that goal, then you will pursue that goal by charting a pathway or figuring out what is the best way to learn how to hear the voice of God as opposed to passively hoping and wishing. Now this kind of this kind of strategy is working works not only for spiritual matter but for everything in your life is that whatever you want to achieve you want to have a very clear goal a very specific goal second not only you want to have a specific goal you want to have a very specific pathway to get there Proverbs 29 verse 18 it tells us that where there is no prophetic vision that is able to see both the goal and the pathway the people cast of restraint you know, so what we look like, we live like wild animals. But blessed is he who keeps the law, that is Torah, instructions. Uh, we'll come back to that later on. Let me give you an example. I, I used a few examples last week on finances. A lot of people misunderstood, misunderstood and thought, thinking that I was giving a financial seminar. But I was just using it as, as an illustration. But today I want to use uh, uh, being, being healthy. You know, in the beginning of the year, everybody's trying to be healthy. I heard people like getting different diets, doing different things, you know, even in this church, right? And so if you, for me, if, if I'm an individual, I'm not saying I am, but if I'm that individual who want to have, have a good, you know, sculpted body, they say, right? And what I do is I will have a picture on my fridge of what that body looks like. I know I heard a preacher, he's 85 years old, and he had this sculpted body on the fridge, and he put his head on top of that body, and he looked at it every day when he goes, go to work, when he would go to work out. And so he had a, a, an image of what he's going to look like when he is 90 years old. Amazing. And that he look at it, he see what the goal is, and then he find out exactly how to get there, how rigid his routine should be, what kind of diet he should have. Unless you have a clear goal and a clear path, everything else is just a pipe dream. Proverbs 13, 11 says, Wealth gained hastily will dwindle, but whosoever gathers little by little will increase. While we do believe in great miracles and abrupt intervention of God in every situation of our life to bring about the miraculous that will put us over the, thought, over the top, we should also know that our success often is based on small victories in life. Our success in life, our success in pursuing goals are always based on small victories that we gain in life. We must be careful as those who believe in the supernatural, who believe in the sudden, abrupt blessings of God, we believe and we pray and we seek in God and we do all that we can. We obey His Word to see the miraculous. For those of us who are believing in the miraculous, we have to be careful not translating our faith inclination to chasing that holy grail for sudden and quick success and throw away diligence, prudence, hard work, and patience. It's always little by little. We have to resist the temptation to just always look for the holy grail or that magic bullet for success. Small victories are very important for big victories. Small successes is what determine your big successes. Go for the four small victories. Celebrate the small victories. Don't worry about the big ones because over time, God is going to give you the big ones according to His Word that will put you over the top. 
But if all you do is pursue the big ones, He will still be faithful to give you the big, the big victories, but because you have not been vigilant, that victories actually need to be paying for some of the negligence that you have committed or, or some, of the, some, some of the prudence that you have not applied. Are you here this morning? For example, there are people that don't, don't, don't spend their time uh, being vigilant and diligent with their finances. They don't spend a lot of diligence. And so they see miracles after miracles of their finances for Christ's purposes. They will, you will hear testimony that, oh, you know, I, I, I needed to pay that debt, you know, and, and creditor was coming after me. I was praying to the Lord. I said, God, help me, help me. And he did. And a windfall came, and all the windfall did was just to fill the hole that they have created themselves. And that windfall is supposed to, supposed to put them over the top if they have small victories, save properly, put away money properly, and be vigilant and prudent over a long period of time. So I want to encourage you, whether it's your finance, your health, you know, like, like we're talking about workout again, right? There are people that want to have big muscles. They can go and celebrate small victories. You know, this first three months, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lift, you know, 50 pounds, you know, and then, and then, and then go to a 55, 60, 70, because that's how, your, how all your body can handle. But there are people that want to go for the quick thing, right? They say, I want to be super, like Superman. I want to look like Superman. I want to look like Superman in three months. What do they do? They take hormones. They go for shortcuts. They kill themselves in the whole process. You see, whatever that you have, you have done to get to where you're at in terms of success, you have to keep doing it. So those guys who have hormones, after they stop eating hormones, you know what they do? They won't be able to lift those weights anymore. And guess what? The muscle will start to decrease and eventually becomes nothing. So what do they have to do? To keep up the image, they have to keep eating hormones. And many of them got killed. Always go for small victories. Always go for small success. And consequently, always celebrate that. You know, back to lifting weight. If you can live, you know, from 50 pounds to 55 pounds, go home and celebrate and have a big French fries or poutine or something like that just to, just to reward yourself. You understand that? It's the same thing as saving, you know. If you save, you know, I finally you got, you got $10,000 in your bank. Oh, go and celebrate and take your wife out for a big dinner. It's like, let's go and have some roast beef dinner tonight, you know, at Ruth Chris or something like that, you know. Splurge away. Celebrate your small victories. Celebrate your small successes. And you will see great successes come along. The fourth point that I want to share today, and I didn't talk about it last week, is from Romans chapter 12, verse 11. When you've set a goal and that you have seen a clear pathway to that goal, what you need to do is to feed fuel to those fire of your passion. Do you understand that? So, for example, if, you, if, you are, if, you are, if you're walking with the Lord, you set a spiritual goal. I can assure you that everything in hell is going to be thrown at you to resist you to reach your goal. What do you do? Well, you have to keep fighting the good fight of faith, yes or no? Now, if you are discouraged, you need something to add the to add the fire to your passion so that you can keep pressing. Because when you're discouraged, when you're cold, when you're, when you're disillusioned, you, you, you have no more courage, you have no more strength, you'll give up. So what you need to do is you need to add fire. That's why Paul said, do not be slothful in zeal. You have to work at keeping that zeal. Be fervent in spirit, serve the Lord. You have to be fervent. How do you keep that zeal? It's not like zeal is going to, a lot of Christians think that the zeal can come by Holy Spirit. Spirit just, boom, give you this fire, and then He always give you the fire, and it is up to Him to keep you lit up all the time. No, you have to not be slothful. Don't wait for somebody to give you the zeal. I will tell you this, there will be times in your walk 
with the Lord and in every goals that you pursue, there will be times and those times will be lots. There will be times that you will feel discouraged. There will be times that you feel giving up. You, you will say to yourself, I've done this for 2,000 times. I'm sick of it. I don't want to do it anymore. Then you need something to keep your fire going. And the Word of God is telling us you need to not be slothful. In other words, don't just let it slide. You need to keep it going. You need to add. Now, let me, let's be honest. Sometimes you don't, you don't even feel like keeping going. Even if you want to, you know, the Word of God says the heart is willing, but the, the strength is, the, is weak. The flesh is weak. So what do you do? Well, you build infrastructure around you that will make sure that the zeal is fervent all the time. What does that mean? You, you have people, you build relationship around you that will encourage you. I'll tell you this, in your walk with the Lord, there will be a lot of times you feel discouraged and don't want to come to church anymore. You say, oh, it's too cold. I don't want to be there anymore. It's too cold. Today is minus forever. I just don't want to get out there. It's too cold. And what if you have a brother or sister that walk by or call you? up and say, hey sister, are you going to church today? And you know, you know you didn't want to, but you have to say, oh okay, yeah I'm, I, I, I will go, alright. You know, or, or a brother will come and pick you up and say, hey, I'm coming to pick you up. You are building infrastructure to maintain that fire. Are you here this morning? So that, that means that you and I need to make an effort to be in relationship all the time. Don't isolate yourself. You as a couple or an individual, if you isolate yourself, you are assuring yourself of failure. You need to build infrastructure that they will keep the fuel going in your fire. Sometimes you run out of fuel. Oh, you don't want to pray anymore. You know, people say, speak in tongues and pray, but you don't feel like it. But if you have built the infrastructure around you and say, hey, you know, there are people that when they see your call, they call you up, they encourage you, not going to condemn you. Don't get people to condemn you. Don't build infrastructure with people that will condemn you. Those are the people you don't need, but they will encourage you. They will, they will, they will encourage your faith. They will, they will cause you to rise up. Just be Build those relationships. They're important. So when we have small groups starting at the end of February, oh, just go get yourself plugged in. Plug into a small group. Every single time I see a couple struggle, individual struggle, I ask them, why are you struggling? Where are your friends? They say, well, we don't have any friends. And then I ask them, why are you not plugging into the small group? Well, I'm too busy. Well, Plug into a small group, build an infrastructure around you, then you can be encouraged when you're discouraged. You and I are not meant to walk alone ever in anything. We need our brothers and sisters. They're the body of Christ. They are our arms. They are our feet. They are the grace of God that will keep the fuel of fire going. So get that infrastructure going. So, so number four, if you have a goal and a path, but you cannot keep going, you most likely will finish in the first quarter of the path or even halfway through the path. Because along the way, there will be a lot of discouragement. You will face a lot of discouragement. You see, we always need to look for fuel for our fire. And saints of God, you and I have this amazing privilege to access the Holy Spirit. When we are discouraged, you just have to be honest with God. Don't have to put up a religious front and try to be, oh God, you know, I, I just don't want you to feel offended that I, I, I'm not on fire. He knows already. You don't have to pretend. You just say, Jesus I'm discouraged. I'm, I'm feeling bad. I'm feeling awful. I just don't know what to do. Would you, would you, would, would you encourage me? I need your presence. I, was, I always share this scripture uh, in, 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 uh, in Psalms. I can't remember where it is at. Um, it was, uh, it was uh, one of the musicians or music directors in the times of David and Solomon. And this music director was appointed by David um, to direct music in the temple, worship and praise in the temple. He wrote a lot of songs. Asaph, right? His name is Asaph. He wrote a lot of songs in Psalms. And after David passed away and, and uh, now King Solomon was king, you know, and King Solomon was good in the beginning, but in the midway of his, his, his reign, he started to falling off, you know, having wives and and people in the kingdom started to serve other things, serve idols and so forth. And he looked around, he was so discouraged. 
He was so discouraged that people were forsaking God, leaving their faith, leaving, leaving God. And he was so discouraged. And what makes him more discouraged was that all those people who were leaving their faith, they seemed to be more successful than ever. Like Solomon, nothing happened to him. He continued to have all thousands of wives and, and things kept going well for him. He kept getting wealthier and wealthier and so forth. So, so this, this worship director, he was so discouraged. And he started writing about his discouragement. You know, why God? Why? I have a lot of whys like we do, right? Sometimes when we pray, it's like, why God? Why? 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 All the whys. And then in the middle of that song, he said, but I went into the house of God. And it's funny because right after he said, I went in the house of God, all the preceding statements become so energetic and powerful. He started to see amazing things about God. And he started to feel great about himself, great about his faith, great about the house of God, great about the temple of God. All his questions were not answered. If you read the first portion and the second portion, they're completely different, unrelated portion. God didn't answer all his whys. But you know what? When you come into the presence of God, all the whys would melt away. It became un they became unnecessary. They became unimportant because now the presence of God is satisfying your aching heart. It's filling your aching heart with joy. Ladies and gentlemen, that is a fuel for the fire we need, is the presence of God. When you feel like your fire is running out, and the people that you have built around you, had, had created relationship around you, don't seem to be available, that's when you can come to the presence of God and say, Holy Spirit, I need you. Come, Holy Spirit. Get into His presence. You will see that your fire that he will begin to put fuel again into that flickering fire. And before you know it, it's just burning and burning and bright and, and encouraging you again. And you become energetic and hopeful again in your pursuit of the goal and the plans and the purpose that he has for you. Now, let me start what I actually had wanted to speak about all this time. Now, how do you establish goals and determine their pathways. A lot of us, we hear a lot of ideas from the mass media, from friends that we talk to. We have, many people have many ideas of what our goals should be and many pathways that they would point to us how we should go about and get to that goal. Those are great. We can set our own goal, set our own path, and many people have. But you know, as believers, we can do something else. We can ascertain the goal and the path that's already been set for us. The perfect destiny and the perfect pathway that is set for us, that is perfect for how we have been wired. I'll say it again. You can go and determine your own goal based on whatever you've learned in the mass media or education or relatives, culture, whatever. You can set that, and you can set the pathway by going to different seminars. and Those are great, and there are lots of them available, especially this information age. Or may I suggest to you that each and every one of us are built uniquely to fulfill a very unique destiny. In other words, you have a perfect destiny waiting for you, that perfect destiny is only you able to achieve because God has specifically wired you a certain way to achieve that destiny and nobody else can. You're the only one that can make, make clothing that nobody could make. I'm just using an example. You're the one that probably could preach like nobody could preach. You're the only one that probably could teach nobody could teach. But unfortunately, a lot of us had taken on the goal and therefore the pathway of the world or suggestion by, suggestion by well-intended people to tell us what our goal and our path is. I remember when I was younger, you know, I always thought that if you truly love God, you have to serve God full-time as a pastor in the church. Yeah. 
And then every, every other career is secondary. I was thinking about it this morning. I remember when I was a young, teen, uh, older teenager in my high school, I heard a preacher, an older preacher. He was saying this, if you're called, I think I quoted him before, if you're called to be a preacher, don't stoop to be a king. And then I thought to myself this morning, I said, well, those statements are encouraging to those pastors. Only to those pastors. And the rest of us chop livers. Because now we know better is that every career that you picked, if you're walking in the will of God, you are serving God 100%. Whether you're in business, whether you're in engineering, whether you are programmers, whether you are director of some kind in a government department, or whether you are some kind of manager in banks, if you are serving, if you are following the will of God, you are serving Him 100%. You are serving God as much as I'm standing here yakking away. Are you here this morning? So in the old days, we always say, you know, and so we, we try to, because of that, we try to impose ideas on people that we look, they look a bit spiritual. You know, the people that come to church all the time, they go to every prayer meeting, we assume that they want to be a pastor. We assume that they need to go to Bible school. So we say things like, I think maybe you're called. You should go to Bible school. Well, maybe they're not. Maybe they're supposed to be the next prime minister and you just ruin it. If you're called... If you're, if, if you're called to serve God as an as, as a, a, a executive vice president or CEO, then you are serving God as much as we are serving God, serving in the church. No diff. Maybe the only difference is that you make more money. Anyways, whatever the goal is, you and I, the best way to find out the goal, the destiny that is specifically designed for who we are and what we are, the best way to do it is to find out from the Lord. Jesus' success on earth came because he did just that. You remember Jesus when he was on earth, even the small little things he would consult first with the Father. He would wait for the Father for the immediate steps. Like whether to go and raise Lazarus up, and Father said no, and he stayed. Or for his long-term goal as his life, what his life would be. Every single steps, every direction he took, they're all what the Father had wanted. And that's why he was able to accomplish what he accomplished in 33 and a half years. In fact, let me correct that, in three and a half years. Most of us, I would say all of us, can't even accomplish what Jesus did with the entire lifetime we have. Never mind about three and a half years. Let me tell you this. If you learn how to hear from the Lord, and you learn from Him your destiny, and you learn from Him your pathway, you will avoid lots of pitfalls and save yourself from a lot of headaches and disappointment and confusion. So, let's get to the meat. How then does God lead? I got a few points. Turn with me to Psalms 139, verse 23. It says, Search me, O God. And know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. Verse 24. And see if there's any grievous way in me. And this is what I want to focus on. Lead me in the way of eternity, in the way that you have set out, in a way that is everlasting, in a way that has been proven to be true and right. And some translation is the ancient ways. You know, in the true translation actually say in the timeless way. When God leads us, He leads us in a timeless way. In other words, ways that is supernatural but is perfect. The way God leads us is from the heart. 
It starts from the heart. It starts from here. Some says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Is he asking God to reveal to God what his heart is? See, in Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 10, we have been told that God already knows all of our heart. Why is he asking God to search his heart? As if God didn't know. But he knew. The reason is because David is asking God to search his heart so that God can reveal his own heart, David's heart, to David. He asked God to first start with the heart. That's the way David is praying. What David is asking the Lord to do is to lead him in the way of the supernatural by first help him to know who he was, where he was at. You can only start improving when you know who you are. Many of us don't know who we are. We've been told of something, but most of the time they were lies. We were told that God hates us. We were told that God is displeased with us. We were told that because of our mistakes and error in the past, God has no interest in us. All He's got for us is a bunch of fire to burn us to pieces or burn us, melt us away. We've been told that God doesn't love us. We're not worthy. But I want to tell you this. You don't need to know who you are. You need to know that you're a child of God. You need to know that you'll be redeemed. You'll be made perfect. You'll be made holy. Not because of what you've done, but because of what He done. You need to know who you are. Because if you don't know who you are, however perfect the path is, you can't walk in it because you will feel like you're unworthy to walk in it. So many of us believe only temporary about the Word of God of who we are. But when challenges come, what do they do? They go, oh, oh, it's me. Oh, it must be my mistakes. It must be that mistake that I've done in the past. Oh, stop it. you got to be convinced and know who you are in Christ Jesus. You are a child of God. You've been redeemed, purchased by the blood of Jesus. He loves you, and He wants the best for you, and He still wants the best for you today, right now. you got to know who you are. Knowing who you are will also help you to understand your own ways. Now, many of us, we need to know we are a child of God. That's great. But we don't understand our behavior. I was sharing with somebody. I share it all the time, actually. I said, do you wonder why you behave a certain way that you behave that you don't like? He said, well, well, I'll always behave that way. I don't know why. And they try cold turkey. They try to do different things, and it's not working. So I gave them an analogy. I said, you know, a lot of times our behavior is based on the scars that is in us. And some of them have been hidden away to the point that we forgot. And yet they're still raw. The wounds are still raw. And so we, we behave a certain way because of the raw wounds. Let me give you an example. I would say, you know, every time you cut yourself, yeah, you cut yourself. And then while it's on a way to be healed, when the raw wound is still raw, you hit it, you react very quickly because it's very painful, yes? Now, if there's no wounds, you can hit it. There's still nothing. Well, better yet, better analogy. So you cut yourself, and your wife came and touched you and hold your hand, and it will hurt you. So what you do, you react negatively by that, that affectionate touch. But if there's no wounds there, your wife comes and she holds your hand, you're like, oh, you feel great. <laughs> do you understand that? So many of us react to a certain way in our life. We don't know why. And so we try to figure it out using psychology, blah, 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 whatever. But you need to know that the reason we act the way they react is because of all the experiences that we have and every negative thing that have been said to us and every negative experience that have been said to us and every positive and positive things that have been said to us. Over time, we are the sum of all our decision and all the decision that are made by others on us. You are the sum of all the decisions that you made. Now, you have the responsibility of some of the decisions you make. And the decision that I have made that, that, been, that been, it had impacted you, made on you, a decision it made on you, good or bad, you're the sum. And, and so we are what we are today. It's because of all the experiences that we have thus far, because of the, all the decisions. But God is here not to judge us. But to heal us, even to in those secret wounds that we, we have forgotten they exist. 
to heal us to the point that now we can be whole again and that we can react properly and receive properly. Sometimes you hear a sermon like that because of the raw wounds that you had had. You're offended because you think I'm talking to you. You thought I read your email or something. I hack into your system and read your email. No. God loves you. He wants to heal you. And he wants to start at the place where you're at. And that he looks at you as his precious daughter, precious son. Your status have not changed. Nothing has changed in his eyes in spite of all your mistakes. But what he needs to do is to heal you so that you can walk in your destiny. And that's what you need to say, search me, O God. Am I acting funny, grievous ways? Am I, am I, what, what's, what's in my heart? What's, what's, what's bothering me? What is it that, why is it that I look at things like that? And, and you ask God, and He'll reveal to you not to condemn you, so that He can heal you. Why? So that He can lead you to the way the perfect way to your goals, the everlasting way, the ancient ways, the proven, the tried, the perfect way He had set out from the foundation of the world, even before the foundation of the world, so that He could lead you to fulfill your destiny. If you're frustrated that you've finished university and you're still bouncing around, going nowhere, I think this message is for you this morning. The first thing God wants to do when he, you know, he said, God, I want to have a fantastic career. I, I want to become successful. Yeah, he wants that too. But the first thing he's going to do, he's going to go to the heart first. He's going to heal the heart, and he's going to lead you from the heart outwards. That's what he does. And so this morning, I'm running out of time. <laughs> I still have three full points. So we're going to do part three next week. Amen. Thank you.